Welcome to random sampling from a distribution with applications to Markov chain simulations. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. One way we can conceptualize probability distributions is to understand them to be models for measurements we might make or experiments we might perform. The act of sampling from a probability distribution can be thought of as a simulation of making such measurements or collecting such data. This can be a very powerful technique to employ, so we'll begin this video lesson with the necessary foundations for how to sample from a distribution in general. Then we'll conclude by applying that knowledge to the continuation of our vegetation succession dynamics example. Suppose a random variable x could take on just three values, 0, 1, and 2. Furthermore, suppose x was distributed according to the probability mass function f of x equals 0 0.2 if x is 0, 0 0.5 if x is 1, and 0 0.3 if x is 2. When we say we'd like to sample from the distribution f of x, what we mean in principle is that we'd like to measure a set of values of x such that the relative frequencies of each value, 0, 1, or 2, in our set of measurements closely approximate the theoretical probabilities of 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3 defined by f of x. With this in mind, there are several ways we could go about sampling from f of x in practice. However, one of the simpler approaches would be to execute the following steps. Create an ordered list D that consists of n numbers. Of these, 0.2n have the value 0, 0.5n have the value 1, and 0.3n have the value 2. If n is sufficiently large, it is acceptable to round these counts to the nearest integer. Then, randomly select, with replacement, a set of k equals 25 of the numbers from the list d. This results in a set x that consists of values 0, 1, and 2, distributed according to f of x. Of course, this is really just pushing the problem down the road a little bit. In order to accomplish the second step of this process, we need a way to randomly select values from a list. This could be done mechanically. For instance, you could write each entry in the list on a scrap of paper, fill a hat with all your scraps of paper, and then randomly select scraps from that hat with replacement. There are also algorithmic ways of accomplishing this task. One of them, known as a linear congruential generator, LCG, is described in our text. The purpose of learning about this algorithm is to build some intuition about what is actually going on when we randomly sample from a probability distribution. There are also commercial random number generators that automatically sample values from a given probability distribution. In practice, it's really best to just use these. For now, our main focus will remain on randomly sampling from a probability distribution as a concept. We'll now carry out the process of sampling from our simple distribution f of x in an example involving a fairly small data set in order to illustrate it more concretely. Our goal is to generate a random sample of k equals 25 numbers that are distributed approximately according to the distribution f of x equals 0 0.2 if x is 0, 0 0.5 if x is 1, and 0 0.3 if x is 2. To do so, we construct a, d, a set d that serves as a population and consists of n equals 1,000 numbers. Of these, 0.2n, or 200, have the value 0. 0.5n or 500 have the value 1, and 0.3n equal 300 have the value 2. The set D is the population we'll sample from. Next, we use any algorithm that suits us in order to produce a set I that consists of k equals 25 indices, ranging in value from 1 to n equals 1,000. LCG could be an option here. In any case, our indices might turn out to be the set that looks like i equals 41, 111, 613, 798, and then several more until you get to the value 745. What's important is that these numbers were selected randomly from the list, 1 through 1,000. They appear with equal probability, and they might appear with repetition. These numbers indicate that we should select the 41st, 111th, 613th, 798th, etc. numbers from our population D. Some indices have been omitted from our list for, for brevity. 
If we do that, we obtain the following sample from D, and it consists of the 41st number in D, the 111th number in D, the 613th number in D, the 798th number in D, on up through the 745th number in D. And in practice, that set of numbers looks like this sequence of zeros, ones, and twos that we're looking at now. Because we've constructed D so that it consists of 20% zeros, 50% ones, and 30% twos, and because we've selected our indices of selection from the set 1 through 1,000 with replacement and with equal probability, we are then ensuring that the numbers in this sample x are approximately distributed according to the probability mass function f of x. There's no need to take that statement, however, at face value. We can explore it experimentally by plotting the numbers in our sample in a relative frequency histogram and comparing that histogram to the theoretical histogram for our probability distribution f of x. And that's what we're looking at on the screen right now. And we can see that at least qualitatively, the histograms line up reasonably well. There's some minor differences in the amplitudes of each of the bars, but the shape in an overall sense is correct. So this approach seems to have some promise. Our approach will perform better with larger samples than k equals 25. This can be seen simply by regenerating a new set of indices i and using them to select a new sample. If k stays as small as 25, not all index values will lead to histograms that agree with f as well as the one we've seen. We'll see this in the technological companion to this video lesson. There is nothing unique about the probability mass function f of x that makes it more suitable to be sampled from than any other probability distribution. For instance, we could have just as easily sampled from the binomial distribution with n equals 7 trials and a probability of p equals 0.67 of observing a preferred outcome on any given trial. This would have resulted in a sample of data with a relative frequency histogram that approximated the theoretical probability mass function of the binomial distribution. If we were to actually carry out this experiment, the empirical histogram of the relative frequencies of the sample, and then the theoretical histogram for the binomial distribution itself, might compare somewhat like the two histograms that we're seeing in this diagram. Well, we're at the point now where we can apply this concept of sampling data from a probability distribution to something really pretty practical. And that application is going to be to simulating dynamics with a Markov model, in particular with a discrete time Markov model. So we're going to return to our example involving succession dynamics in vegetation and desert plant communities. So while studying the various methodologies for rational inquiry, recall that we developed a model for those succession dynamics in desert plant communities. What that model told us was that if we wanted to determine the probability of observing a landscape to be dominated by one of three possible vegetation categories, shrubs, grasses, or bare land, at some future point in time, then what we would need to do is compute or measure those three probabilities for the current point in time and multiply them on the left by the so-called transition probability matrix. So our notation for this model says that if x of t equals 1, 2, or 3, that represents the events that the patch of land that we're looking at is dominated by the shrub species, the grass species, or bare ground at that particular time t. So this is a stochastic model that predicts the evolution of those probabilities over time. We assumed that we could measure the initial probabilities of each of these three states and found them to be 0 0.69, 0 0.13, and 0 0.18 for the probabilities of finding the landscape dominated by shrubs, grasses, or bare ground initially. We also assumed that we were able to determine the probabilities within the transition matrix. 
And these are given in the 3 by 3 matrix below, where the first column has the values 0 0.7, 0 0.14, 0 0.16. The second column has the values 0 0.25, 0 0.63, 0 0.12. And the third has the values 0 0.11, 0 0.04, and 0.85. Now these are made up values, but as we'll see in future videos, we'll have ways of, of measuring these values from data. What we were able to do with this model so far was to predict the time evolution of each of the probabilities representing that the landscape is dominated by shrubs, grasses, or bare ground. We saw that in time, these each stabilized to constant values of 33%, 18%, and 49% respectively. The interpretation of this was that we would eventually expect to see that 33% of the land at the study site will be dominated by a shrub species, roughly 18% of the land will be dominated by grasses, and the remaining 49% of the land would be dominated by bare ground. Well, that's all review, but now that we have the ability to sample from a probability distribution, and if we recognize that the three columns of the transition matrix just represent three different probability distributions, well, we're in a position where we can predict which state dominates a given patch in the landscape at each time step. So suppose we measured that grasses dominated a patch initially. The second column of the transition matrix represents the transition probabilities from the grass state to any of the other three states. And so these probabilities are 0.25 to transition to shrubs, 0.63 to stay at grasses, and 0.12 to transition to bare ground. We could then randomly sample a 1, 2, or 3 representing shrubs, grasses, or bare ground according to these probabilities by creating 25 ones, 63 twos, and 12 threes, and then selecting one of them at random. This would become our next state, at least in principle. We would continue the process by sampling according to the transition probabilities from the column that corresponds to whatever vegetation category is dominating our patch in the landscape at the current time. This is a stochastic model, so the results are going to be different each time we implement it. But one instance is visualized below where we're graphing the current dominant state versus time we can see that there's some random jumping from state to state from time to time. And then at other times, there's constant residence at that state over a few time steps. So it's pretty typical of this kind of Markov chain model. We can see that the dominant state of the patch appears to transition randomly between x of t equals 1, x of t equals 2, and x of t equals 3. If we were to count up the number of times each of these states appeared in the time series and then divide those counts by the total number of iterations, we'd compute frequentist probabilities of observing any given patch of land dominated by shrubs, grasses, or bare land. These probabilities would approach the values 33%, 18%, and 49% that we saw earlier if we observed our time series for a long enough period of time. So what we've just seen is really just a conceptual illustration of how we would simulate a system that can be modeled by a discrete time Markov chain. In practice, we wouldn't really sample so mechanically by imagining creating so many ones, twos, and threes in a set and just, just drawing them from a hat. We would go back and use something like the random number generator um, and the linear congruential generator that we described earlier inside of a computer program. And that'll be the subject of the technological companion to this video lesson. However, before we get there, there's a few things that we should establish about what it is that we've actually done and what it is that we still have to do if we expect to be able to model systems effectively with Markov chains. And one of the biggest outlying problems that we've got is that it's by no means obvious that we should expect to know 
the values of the nine entries of our model's transition matrix. In order to implement our simulation so far, we've simply made up values that would satisfy the conditions needed for our model to actually be a discrete time Markov model. But they bore no connection to anything that would actually be going on in a real desert plant community. We'd like to be able to find a way of making a connection between our theoretical transition probabilities and the actual mechanics of what's happening in such a desert plant community. The approach we're going to spend our time on involves learning estimates for the values of the transition probabilities from large amounts of observations of the system being modeled over time. We will need to learn quite a bit about parameter estimation before we can understand that approach. But the general idea is that we will observe a long time series representing the states that one instance of our system can be found in from iteration to iteration, and then use that time series, use information that we can extract from that time series to estimate the true values of the transition probabilities. Now for quite some time, I've been throwing around terms like Markov chain and Markov model, and it's really time that we have a careful formal definition for what that is. So what we're working with is known as a discrete time Markov model, and I'm defining it here. Let x sub t be a sequence of random variables that represent the state in which a system is observed at time t. Assume that there are a countable number of possible states the system could be in. If the probability of the random variable x sub t plus 1, given x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, all the way up through x sub t, is just equal to the probability of x sub t plus 1 given x sub t, then we say that x of t is a Markov chain. In other words, the state we observe the system in at a future time depends only on the state it is currently in. So it's called the Markov prob property, and it's one of the things that we need to have in place for our model to be a discrete time Markov model. Moreover, if p of x sub t plus 1 given x sub t is equal to x sub t given x sub t minus 1, and that's true for all values of time that we're studying our model over, then x sub t is called a stationary Markov chain because the transition probabilities p of x sub t plus 1 given x sub t are independent of time. We can place our last example in the context of this definition. The random variable x sub t had three possible values, one, two, and three, shrubs, grasses, and bare ground. p of x sub t plus 1 given x sub t is simply a compact notation for referring to each of the nine transition probabilities. Since each transition probability predicts the next state using knowledge only of the previous state, our model is a Markov chain. Since those predictions are made over discrete increments in time, our model is a discrete time Markov chain. Finally, our model is also stationary because the transition probabilities are just constant numbers. They're all independent of time. Therefore, our model really fits into the context of a stationary discrete time Markov model. And that brings us to the end of this video lesson. An upcoming video in this series will be the technological companion to this video lesson, and the main purpose of it will be to have an opportunity to implement this Markov model in MATLAB. That way we'll be able to experiment with what it's like in practice to use a Markov chain model to simulate a time series of states that represent the succession dynamics of different vegetation classes in a desert plant community like the one that we've been studying in our sequence of examples. So I hope you found this theoretical background useful and want to thank you for watching and hope you'll be able to join us with the next technological companion.